Hi, I'm Kristen. I'm the CEO of the Martin Agency, headquartered in Richmond, Virginia. We're a creative ad agency. Perhaps you know some of our clients, Geico, Oreo, DoorDash, CarMax, Old Navy, UPS. It's a hard job, but a fun one. We get to think of creative solutions to business problems. We get paid to be inventive and clever. Guess what day it is, huh? Anybody? We need to be boneless thugs now in ways that surprise and delight people. And we feel lucky, really pretty lucky. I'm gonna tell you a secret. I have been scared since the day I got this job, but I hope it's the kind of scared that has made me better. You see, I'm the first female CEO in my company's history. And Danny, our chief creative officer, is the first black chief creative officer in our company's history. We have been able to manage in our short time together through some major story arcs of our time, Me Too, Time's Up, Black Lives Matter. As a woman and a black man, these stories aren't 30,000 feet in the air, four times removed for us. They're our story. It's personal, it's not ethereal to us. That has been, in fact, I think an advantage. You see, we're motivated by this special concoction, two parts hope and one part urgency, to solving problems, and they motivate us on the toughest of days. Because in some ways, when you've been prepping on the sidelines for your whole career and you get the chance to run out on the field, you're ready. You trust your instincts. Hopefully you've got people cheering for you and that makes all the difference. It made all the difference last March when this global health pandemic changed the way that we went to market day to day. You see last March, retail, restaurants, car dealerships, grocery stores, they were all closing their doors to in-person shoppers. There was a lot of chatter on the airways about the trials of working from home and missing pallets of toilet paper. But for us, it was a time to lean into our clients' business and fight for their highest possible good. Now you might be thinking, why is advertising even important? Where's the CEO of Charmin to tell us where those missing pallets of toilet paper are? At their best, Great ads bring value to your balance sheet by strengthening your brand name. They buy you time between product innovations. They help with repeat purchase. They create conversation and relevance. They make your employees proud. They can define what's next and what's possible. They enable you to charge more or reach a greater number of people. They help you build momentum behind your company's vision. They help make your company successful, which enables you to hire more people or fund progress. History shows that brands that keep the ad lights on fare nine times better after a crisis is over. When you're there for people when times are tough, then you mean more for people when times are better. And during the beginning days of COVID, 77% of consumers said they wanted brands to help. And an equal number of people said they wanted to know what brands were specifically doing to make things better. So we armed our clients with that information so that they would feel emboldened to choose action over paralysis. Things were changing, but there were good reasons for clients to engage. Internally, we got everybody together and went through each client looking for authentic ways and reasons that our clients can meaningfully interact with consumers. For DoorDash, how do we help buoy the restaurant industry? Or Buffalo Wild Wings, how can we help bring you sports even when there are no sports on? For Oreo, can we inject playfulness into the toughest of situations? For UPS, how can we be servant leaders to the people of the world? And Ritz, how do we turn a harsh world into a welcoming one? Internally, we look for ways to be nimble and get those messages out in the world under new constraints. It wasn't easy, but it was inspiring. At this time, there were growing challenges on how we actually produce ideas, talent, travel, legal, insurance restrictions. But rather than give up, we asked ourselves, what if? What if we could use drones to take pictures? What if we could use existing photography? What if we use the creativity showing up all around us in the world to tell new stories? What if we sent cameras to individuals in different locations to film independently and then had the film digitally transferred back to us to edit together? Just good. Put in that word, Devin. What if we could have one person on camera captured by a series of stationary cameras operating at a social distance? What if we use design to create conversation or animation? 
As other countries opened up, we figured out how to do remote productions, where our people would work all night long to be virtually on set in Sweden to orchestrate with locals on the ground. As each what if became reality, our confidence grew. Soon we were creating ads for multiple clients. In the first six weeks, we produced 20 ads for 11 clients, and then eight more brands followed with 11 more ads. In fact, 88% of our clients produced ads in the first six weeks of COVID. A Herculean effort at any time, but at this time, it was unimaginable. As the weeks turned into months, we started to ask ourselves, what if we could bring people joy? So we brought DoorDash together with Sesame Street. And let me guess, cookies? Wah, me hungry. Yeah. Ugh. Perfect time. And Geico with Tag Team. Scoop it is, scoop it is, scoop it is, scoop shakalaka, 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 shakalaka. Those ads brought us joy as well. I mean, who doesn't love a good bowl of ice cream? Then potential clients started to call. To date, we have 10 new client relationships that have started since we went to work from home. So we needed to hire. Almost a third of our company is new to the agency since the beginning of COVID. Importantly, our clients' brands are visible, consumers are rooting for them, and our employees are working. What started as a constraint has become one of the most productive times in our company's history. This wasn't just a story about our clients' brands, but our own brand as well, and how we took care of our own people during this time. We recognized it was both a sprint and a marathon. The sprint mattered because it gave our clients first mover advantage, and that momentum was a tremendous differentiator. But it also mattered that it was a marathon. We needed to make sure our people had sustenance because we didn't know how long the pandemic would last or the economic recovery that would follow. So we went to great efforts to support them even more than before. From handwritten notes and intermission hours during the day to a bonus day off over Mother's Day weekend because everyone needed a little bit more care and concern. We gave out flowers and money hugs. Those are financial bonuses to help offset the cost of working from home. Our executive committee felt it was necessary to meet daily to get aligned. And one of us made a video and sent it to the staff weekly as well as messages with creative thoughts were sent out every Wednesday. We drove thermometers to people when they were feeling sick, and picked up groceries when someone was settling in. While other companies pulled back on their people spend, we increased it. We trained our people in resilience and even reconciliation during Black Lives Matter, all to ensure that the talented people of our company had what they needed to help our clients. My one piece of advice when the world is basically encouraging you to slow down and stop and things feel paralyzing, play offense. Trust in your values and trust that you will get through to the other side, a better version of yourself. Well, thank you so much. That was very inspiring. So we've got some questions rolling in. And um, I, the first question I, I see here is, how did you make good decisions that obviously took quite uh, a bit of time and effort while staying nimble and being able to sort of pivot on a dime? What, what, mm. How did you balance that? That's a good question. First, let me say thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a privilege and an honor to um, to be in a position where the university would be interested in anything that um, that I would have to say. So I'm thrilled. Um, I would say that, uh, and this is probably true of leadership in general, but very much true of leadership in a moment like COVID when there were so many changing variables at one time. But we had to get comfortable with moving forward with maybe 60% of the information. We had to get comfortable moving forward um, with the lack of certainty and give ourselves the freedom and the ability to pivot if we found we were wrong. But we decided early on that decisiveness mattered more than perfection. And that the best thing we could do was to make a judgment, make a call, keep moving forward, because we were really nervous that if we stopped moving, that we would never get the wind back in our sails. So um, we just kind of kept 
going and then pivoting all along. I think one thing that helped that is we met daily as a leadership team. We didn't know that on the first day. It probably took about a week for us to figure that out. And we found that um, we were giving different information out to the staff. And so we thought we owed it to them and to us to be on the same page. And the more we kept talking, the, the more we can now finish each other's sentences. So we're a year in and we've met every day for an hour. It's been helpful. Thank you. So I think I'm hearing, uh, you don't have to have 100% certainty, uh, but communication is key and you communicate whatever it is you do know. You don't wait until you know everything to, to start the communication. Thank you. And this is a question from one of our um, guests in the audience today. So it says, I am worried that marketing has lost its way and it seems to be more of a method to dupe people into responding or signing up or whatever carrot is being dangled rather than relaying the attributes and qualities of a product or service and how that helps people. Am I the only one who feels that way? Well, that's a tough one. It is. Um, I would say that's probably how people feel about everything nowadays, not just marketing. It could be that people feel that way about politics and um, sports and everything. Um, I would say you're not the only one because I think that skepticism has increased about people's motives across the board, uh, regardless of industry, um, whether that's healthcare or, um, you know, advertising or religion or politics. I think there is a, um, a skepticism in consumers today, in people today, in voters today. But I think that there is also, therefore, an equal responsibility on the part of all these businesses to do the right thing. One thing that, and it was a stat that we shared in the video, that 70%, um, 77% of consumers wanted to know specifically what brands were doing to help and wanted brands to help. I think one thing that we have seen is that it used to be that people defaulted to kind of um, religion or government uh, to help when times go bad, when there's a, um, you know, an environmental issue or, um, a, you know, a societal issue. And today people see that brands have an equal, if not greater responsibility to also solve major problems, systemic problems. And, um, and so our clients lean into their brand purpose to do that. And our job is to help communicate that. Um, so in the case of DoorDash, you know, they made a $200 million commitment to helping keep restaurants open, to keep the kitchens open. And they waived their delivery fees so that businesses could sign up and the kitchens could stay open so that people could stay employed. UPS never stopped at all during the entire pandemic in any country, in any part of the world. And, um, and people had to know that they could order products and get the products or get the vaccine. They're now delivering the vaccines. Uh, Old Navy, you know, donated $30 million worth of clothing, and we wanted people to know that as well. So um, I do think there are a lot of companies that are doing things right, and we try to help. We try to make sure we select the clients that are going to do the right thing, and, and we encourage them to do the right thing. Thank you. That's really interesting, and it kind of leads into another question that we have. So, um, you know, some business practices have changed, and certainly it sounds like your clients have um, embraced you know, what they truly believe in. Um, what, what parts, uh, main parts of sort of the marketing function do you see that changed during COVID and that you're going to keep on you know, embracing that change and moving forward with it? Um, well, from the agency side, I mean, I'm sure there are things that changed on the client side as well as the agency side. On our side, one thing that changed was the speed with which we made work and, um, and the way that um, we didn't have to be physically present. And I think that, that we, we've got, you know, we were very nimble and very quick, our clients and we were very decisive. And I think what happened is we shortened the time frame that it often takes because everyone was willing to be decisive. And when that happened, our trust in each other grew. And I think coming out of this pandemic, I don't think that the trust that we established with our clients is going to go away. And now we all know what we can create in a short amount of time. And so we will, um, I think sometimes you deliberate a long time because you're not confident that the other side is going to care as deeply as you are 
about whatever issue it is. And I think that um, we both earned it in each other's eyes and we both saw each other put the other first in many respects. And, um, and I think that trust will stay there. I think the nimbleness will stay there. I think the speed with which we make things will stay there. Good, thank you. Um, and this is from Melissa Jackson from FCB uh, Chicago. FCB. And it sounds like you two have I know met Melissa, yeah. Hi. And hi. And so she says, I think you mentioned that 88% uh, of Martin's clients produce new work within the first six weeks of the pandemic. In your opinion, how do you convince nervous clients to move forward and make breakthrough work uh, during uncertain times? And you may have already answered this. I heard the word trust. Well, yeah, it is, but I think there's kind of two parts to this. The first thing we did is we did very quickly. So I found out on a Wednesday that we would probably be going to work from home on Friday. And um, I immediately pulled a bunch of strategists together and said, we need a white paper that talks about how brands can thrive in, um, in a crisis situation. What are the things that brands have done in other crisis situations that have hockey pucked them forward? And there, this isn't the first crisis we've lived through. It's the first crisis like this, but it's certainly not the first crisis. So we were able to pull together a whole bunch of research quickly and then sent that out to clients so that we were able to see that clients that kept advertising, you know, fared nine times better. Well, that's a, that was something tangible they could go back to their bosses with and say, we should not go dark in this moment. Um, when a lot of people were thinking, you know, we should go dark. Um, so we communicated, we were quick, but I will also say, and this is the hard part, but I think it goes back to what JMU can do and any other university can do. I think that, um, I don't know that all clients are taught to trust that creativity can solve business problems. I think that um, we often talk about the four or five Ps. We talk about the different variables that we can control, but we don't always talk about creativity and breakthrough. And when you think of the bell curve, you tend to focus on the big part of the bell curve, which is how do the masses move? You don't think about the, the tail ends. But the, you know, the whole point of the front half of the bell curve is that the, the early majority won't do something unless someone else has done it first. So really advertising and marketing needs to be focused on the front 16% of the bell curve, in my opinion. How do you give people permission to do something so that the people who need to see a reference point in someone else will then follow? And not enough marketing is aimed towards the front 16% of the bell curve and not enough clients trust creativity to solve business problems. And I think that if we started teaching that more in school, how to have the courage to break through, I think a lot of clients, um, are afraid of breakthrough. I'm not gonna lie, I think they're afraid. People are in general afraid to stand apart. And I think we need to have people have courage to do that um, because 84% of advertising goes unnoticed or unremembered. That's a horrible statistic when you think about the fact that our budgets are dependent on a chief financial officer putting money aside for marketing. And if that person believes that 84% of the time the advertising won't be remembered, then just making an ad and putting it out in the world does not, does not dictate success. And the truth is awareness doesn't correlate to success anymore. And neither does preference. I could be aware of Coke. I can even prefer Coke over Pepsi, but I drink water. It used to be that when you were aware of a product that your sales went up. That's why everyone paid for shelf space at the eye level. Then it was, if I prefer the product, I'll buy it more. And that's when products and brands started to take on personal human characteristics. And we started talking about likability. Now the most accurate predictor of sales success is relevance. And relevance requires that you have a point of view and relevance is measured in conversation. So the most talked about brands grow two and a half times faster than their competitive set. Not the most seen brands. I can, again, I can see Coke. That doesn't mean that I'm buying it, but the most talked about brands grow faster. So the really every marketer needs to be asking themselves, what am I doing to make sure my brand's talked about? And the truth is a lot of clients are actually nervous for their brand to be talked about. They want to be seen, but they're afraid to stand out. And that is actually the hard, the hardest part of our jobs. And so we try to find the clients from the get-go that believe in creativity and believe in breakthrough. And so Melissa, I would say it starts with what clients you choose to partner with. It's very difficult to change a client's point of view um, 
not that it can't be done. It takes, a, it just takes a lot longer, like years versus find the set that already believes in what you believe. Great. Thank you. I, I thought this next question was uh, really interesting from a leadership standpoint. You mentioned one third of your employee base was hired within the pandemic. Can you describe the best ways you have been able to find this talent in this new environment? Oh, that's such a good question. So it's really hard um, in general. But one thing we did, we had a handful of new clients and they weren't actually at a point where they wanted to us to release their name. So normally what happens in the ad industry is when you win a piece of business, there will be a press release saying, you know, the Martin agency wins Geico or something. And then people within the industry know that that agency will be hiring. But sometimes clients don't want to do the press releases because they don't want to reveal their strategy or they don't want to give their competitors heads up yet. And sometimes certain agencies are known for a certain type of work. So we had a situation where we had um, 10 new clients, at that point, maybe seven new clients, and we couldn't release about five of them. So instead, we chose not to release any of them, and we created a fun game where on Twitter, we went out and gave facts about the new clients. We did a hashtag gig alert, but didn't reveal who the clients were, and then had people guess what the clients were, and the more right they got, um, you know, I would call them or we have, you know, they could always get an interview regardless of how they did, but it drew a disproportionate amount of attention to the agency. Then the press called, which allowed us to say we'd won at that point, seven new clients. And then we got a flood of resumes. I mean, 1200 resumes for, you know, uh, 50 jobs in, in a matter of, of no time. And, um, and it, it, that awareness and that, that PR drove um, that visibility of those jobs. I, but I, my answer to almost everything is PR, 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 PR. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's your best friend. <laughs> and then I have a, a question about diversity. It says your leadership team is very diverse. How does that help in times of crisis like this last year? And how do you leverage that? It's such a good question, too. Um, you know, every research study that's been done on diversity and leadership has found that a more diverse leadership team has higher employee engagement, higher returns, higher margin, higher profit. And yet, there are still only 34 female CEOs in the Fortune 500. And we applaud the fact that it's up from 31. And which is still a pathetically low number. Um, and the, it's even, you know, harder when you think of people of color or, 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 other, or other barometers. And yet all the research in the world says that it's true. So the truth is, if you actually are a capitalist, it doesn't even matter if you're a feminist. It doesn't even matter if you, if you're, if you believe in, in equality. If you say you're a capitalist, then the best thing you can do for your company's return is to have a diverse leadership team. And yet the bulk of people, that requires that people that are in the job step aside, some of them, or you have to create new roles in order to pull up more chairs at the table. And sadly, people aren't doing that enough. Um, but it's something I believe I'm a, I'm a stats person. And so when I would read study after study, I would see that and thought the best thing I can do for our company is for me to have a diverse leadership team. So I started at Martin through a back, uh, it's my second tour three years ago. And when I came into the job, there were maybe 10 people on the executive committee, all white, eight men, two women. Today we stand at 63% female and 38% people of color. Um, and we had uh, double digit revenue, double digit margin last year. And it was our second most successful year of growth in the history of the company. So I would, I would say that we are yet another case study of the same information that's been out there in the world. The, the information's not new. I, the question is, what will create a reason for more brands and clients to, to rebuild their business? Well, and you've proven statistics don't lie. So uh, it, not all of sometimes they do, but not well, that. in this case, not. <laughs> it's all so, on how you ask the questions. So I think I've been given a, a warning on we're running out of time, but I really wanted to end with this question because I okay. think it, it's really, um, it kind of sums it all up. It says, This is powerful. Where do you find your positive energy and how to best cascade that ambition down to all team members? Oh, that's a sweet thing to say. Thank you. Um, I, it helps that I love the company that I work for, and I um, and I want to give the people that work with me and for me 
the best opportunities. And so that fuels a lot of my energy. Um, I tend to be a glass half full kind of person in general. Um, and so, um, but I also, we're so selective with our clients. I really feel like um, I want them to succeed. I want them to win. And um, I'm very competitive. I hate to lose even more than I like to win. And so when um, when a client has entrusted us with their business, um, we will move hell and high water to make sure that uh, that they see that as a very good decision. And that that brings me a lot of energy. Well, thank you. I, I could totally see myself working for you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So uh, I, I think you sound like a great leader. And I just want to say thank you. thank you, Kristen, for the wonderful presentation and the insights today. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's Business Insights Speaker presentation. And I would like to ask you to mark your calendars for next week's Business Insights presenter, G.J. Hart, uh, on Tuesday, March 30th at 1215, same time, same place. Um, G.J. serves as CEO of Torchy's Tacos and is former CEO of California Pizza Kitchen. And now I'd like to draw your attention to the slide that Brooke just put up. Uh, so I want you to not forget that today is Giving Day. And um, just like uh, Elizabeth, uh, I'm sorry, Kristen said, I don't know why I'm thinking Elizabeth now. Um, Kristen said, um, you know, we like to win here in the College of Business. We don't like to lose, um, it, uh, but, uh, there are a lot of competitions out there for students and faculty and staff, and um, and we've put some skin in the game, both uh, you know boards in the College of Business, and I personally made some challenges. So I hope you can get out, and we're looking for participation. So uh, you don't have to give a lot of money, but just you know whatever you can give. Um, actually, uh, you know that participation is very important today. So please utilize the QR code on this slide to access the many engagement opportunities, and we will see you next week. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. Thank you, Kristen, very much.